Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to services here at Camden Avenue. Uh, I'd like to welcome those that are, are, are online with us tonight also. Um, I have a lot of announcements for you for you this evening, so bear with me, please. Uh, we want to express our sympathy to the family of Melva Ferris, her brother-in-law, Glenn Hawkins, who a lot of us here at Camden Avenue know, who was a uh, gospel preacher for many years um, up in Maslin, Ohio, passed away. Uh, is, uh, uh, Glenn was a uh, gospel preacher at Maslin for over 47 years. Um, I also like to add to our prayer list, Preston Lahan, a few of us here know him. He's one of our church camp kids from St. Mary's. He is scheduled to have open heart surgery tomorrow morning at the Cleveland Clinic. He'll ha have a hospital stay of four to five days roughly, and then he'll have to stay in the area up there for a few more days until they clear him to travel, and then he'll travel home, and then he'll have like a two to three month recovery process. So keep in your prayers as he has <clears throat> some serious open heart surgery. Continue to remember Harvey Kaplinger, Jim Stoops, uh, Cotton Sayer, and especially Elsie Smith as they're continuing to have uh, uh, treatments. Uh, keep uh, uh, Wanda Blake, that's a friend of Clayton Huber's, uh, in your prayer. She has been placed uh, in hospice care after suffering, suffering a stroke in the last couple days. Continue to be with uh, John Tesh. John's surgery is scheduled a week from tonight, uh, today, in Morgantown. Just keep him in your prayers as he's going to have surgery. As well as keep uh, Madison Hyman in your prayers. She, as we've announced previously, she is on bed rest for the rest of the pregnancy. Uh, and there, uh, In addition to that, there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer to my left if you would like to provide a meal for that family. Uh, keep Kay Mills in your prayers. Kay is in the hospital right now with double pneumonia. Keep K in your prayers. And also keep Peggy Riddle in your prayers. She's experienced some pain, painful complications from uh, a recent eye surgery. Some, some additional announcements. Uh, care group two ladies, care group two ladies will have a meeting in room 109 after Bible class on Sunday. So care group two ladies will have a meeting after Bible class on Sunday morning in room 109. Uh, Christmas cards are back in the hallway to, to, to my right back here. Uh, if you have any, go ahead and get those. If you see some shut-ins that, that aren't here, you see them have some cards, it'd be a good opportunity to just grab some of theirs and take them to them too. The Lads of Leaders Art class is gonna have another session. There'll be uh, Saturday, Jan January 7th from the 10 to two. That's from 10 to two for the Lads of Leaders Art. They'll be in the teacher's workroom upstairs on January 7th. Our next fellowship meal will be this Sunday in, in, in the multi-purpose room. Care group two is in, is in charge of that. Everybody is welcome to that. <clears throat> There's gonna be a one day uh, lectureship at Bridgeport Church of Christ on January 8th from 9.30 to three. Mark Tonkery is speaking at that. Uh, Josh and Zoe are going to have, there, there'll be a uh, uh, a baby shower for Josh and Zoe uh, that will be come and go on Sunday, January 15th from 2 to 5 in the multi-purpose room and they are registered uh, on, on Amazon. We'll have a Lads to Leaders uh, meeting on Sunday, January 15th after the evening services in room 109. So Lads to Leaders meeting on January 15th after evening services. Then uh, here's a, uh, an announcement. We have a change. The men's meeting that's normally scheduled on the 15th will be the, the 22nd at 4 p.m. in the multi-purpose room. So the, the men's meeting this month will be on the 22nd. Uh, we have the, uh, the, the next Red Cross blood drive will be the 28th of February on a Tuesday from 12 to 6. I think that's it. Gary will be leading us in song and John will be... Uh, giving us a devotional this evening. There were 543. Sweet is the song I am singing today. 
I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed. Trouble, sorrow have faced away. I have been redeemed, I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed by love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine, Christ is mine. Christ is mine, all oh, to him I now resign. I have been redeemed. Precious indeed is my Savior to me. I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed. Happy and glory. Someday I shall be. I have been redeemed. I'm redeemed by love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. Christ is mine. All to Him I now resign. Invitation will be number 538. Let us pray together. Dear God and our loving Father in heaven, we are thankful for this occasion that has brought us together. We're thankful for your word that provides direction and guidance in our lives. We pray that you would bless us with wisdom and understanding this evening as we open your word. And then, Father, we pray that you would help us to put it into operation in our daily lives. We're thankful for our teachers and the dedication they have to spread your word. We pray that you would be with our teachers this evening and be with all of us as listeners, that we would uh, fully understand your word and learn from it. We thank you, Father, for all that you bless us with. We're especially thankful for our spiritual blessings. We pray that you would help us always to be thankful to you for those things you give us. There are many people that were uh, notified about today that are suffering with uh, various illnesses and difficult times. We ask your special blessings to all those that are going through the uh, medical treatments, be with the doctors and nurses and and medical personnel work with them, and that uh, all those individuals would receive the healing that's necessary. We're mindful this evening of the loss of Glenn Hawkins, and we pray that you would uh, bless his family and uh, provide comfort and care to them. We're thankful for his example and uh, the influence that he's had in this area and the many years that he's been delivering the gospel. Father, we thank you so much for the fact that we can sing about our redemption this evening. We thank you for your love and the sending of your son. And we pray that you would help us always to share that great love and that great joy with those that we come in contact with. Bless us now throughout the remainder of this evening. Be with John as he brings us the devotional part of this. And bless the word as it is presented. We ask it all through your son's name. Amen. Good evening. 
you want to um, open your Bibles to the verse that I want to use as kind of the main idea tonight, it's Colossians 3, 2. Uh, you can see up there, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. And the way I want to look at that tonight is I want to look at the idea of perspectives. I want to think about how we look at things, our, our view in relation to everything else. Uh, if you want to go to the second slide there. There we go. It all depends on how you look at things. Uh, on there, you can see it, it, was, um, it was very important for one of the guys that got fired from the M&M factory because he was throwing out all the ones with W's on. I want to think about what affects our perspective. How should we approach something we're looking at? Because I think as Christians, we have a chance to use a, a unique perspective to look at our surroundings. First, with how we look at things from a literal standpoint, each of us has our own personal point of view. We have different lives, different experiences uh, that shape how we view things. For instance, if Brandy, my wife, is looking at something with her glasses on, and I'm looking at the same thing without mine, we are 100% not going to view the object the same way. She'll have a fairly clear idea of what she's looking at, and I will not have the slightest clue unless it's like five inches from my face or closer. Um, same way if, if you think about like, uh, if your first experience uh, riding the subway involves getting mugged, you're not going to have the same positive view of riding the subway that someone would that never had a problem. From a spiritual standpoint, we could also have the same idea of everyone having their own point of view, their own personal point of view, if it wasn't for the fact that God provided us with a special lens to use when we, when we look at things, His Word. If you look at like John 17, 14, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We have, we have the, the word of God that we can look to, to kind of focus our perspective as we uh, evaluate things. Um, if you want to go to the next one. There's also an idea of forced perspective. You can kind of see, um, you know, you can kind of use distance in a picture to, to make it seem if you, if it's hard to see there, uh, make it seem like that giant cup with the small person in the background. Um, sometimes, just like that picture, we have to consider some of the things surrounding our perspective, outside forces that can alter what we think we're seeing. Um, for example, if you go to search for something, uh, on, let's say on Google, um, the, the results, you're going to get answers based on not only like, you know, popularity of websites, but also who is paid to have a higher ranking in search results. So it's not, it's not just the quality of information you're getting, um, you're getting ranked, but it's who had the money to pay for uh, you seeing their site. Uh, same type of thing, uh, if you're familiar with a lot of social media, especially uh, the TikTok that's popular now, uh, it has an algorithm it uses to show you videos that it thinks you'll like. Um, when Brandy was talking to me about the fact that um, it, for some reason it's picked up on her being very um, liberal on certain ideas. I don't know. Um, for some reason, I don't know. But so that's what it shows her, and she has to keep trying to get rid of those. Um, and it's it's determined that's what it's going to show. And so if that's all you see, it's going to alter your perspective on some things. Um, just like that, it can be easier to find options that match your own opinion. Um, 
easier than finding unbiased facts to support truth, um, especially in, in how you search. If you go um, with an idea already in your head, and so that's the, the, the words that you use, uh, for instance, um, like if you look for truth about evolution or you know, evolution as truth, you'll find um, results that are gonna be you know, for that idea. And it weeds out all the things that might actually lead you to learning about what the Bible says about um, you know, things like creation and the age of the earth. So it depends on how you go to search. Um, if you look at 1 John 4, 5, they're from the world. Therefore, they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. So we also have to consider not just how we um, focus on things, but we also have to consider who else might be doing the focusing. Um, if we aren't using that lens that I mentioned God gave us, then others will be happy to step in to guide our thinking. Um, if you look at verses like 1 Corinthians 15.33, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Proverbs 4.25, let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. So there are a lot of things that can, that can force or alter our perspective, but if we want to look at the proper perspective, um, if we think about the fact that in a world where it's easy to lose your perspective, or your point of view, how you're looking at things. We need to remember that what matters is where we are or where we're looking in relation to God's word. Um, if you think about Romans 12 too, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And also one more verse. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. It's, it's up to us to keep our, our perspective focused on what God has asked us to do. We know that God's provided us with a way to see what he asks of us. We have a Bible that we can refer to when we need to, and that's a wonderful blessing. If we use his word as our lens for focusing our perspective, we can be assured that we make it to our heavenly reward one day. If, um, if you would like to put on Christ tonight and start using God's guidance in your view of the world as a Christian, or if you have let one of those outside forces that I mentioned turn your focus away from God, and need the prayers and support of your fellow Christians to realign your perspective. I ask that you please come forward now as we stand and sing. Careless soul, why will you linger wandering from the fold of God? Hear you not the invitation of reply my God, careless soul, oh heed the warning, for your life will soon be gone, oh how sad to face the judgment, unprepared. the invitation till the spirit shall depart then you'll see your sad condition unprepared to be by God careless soul oh heed the warning for your life will soon be gone oh how sad
share this time together and we can work together. I guess it should have waited until it got turned on back there. <laughs> but uh, we're glad to have you. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, again, you have blessed us very richly with a beautiful day, a day that we still can move about and that we still have opportunity to share our lives with others and that we can remember the things and see the things that you have created and that you have done on our behalf. We ask you to be with us this evening, Father, in our study, that we can get the most from your word and understand it, and that we can be uplifted and strengthened, and that we can move forward in our lives to be able to help others, that we can share the gospel and the good news and the peace and the love that you give each one of us. Thank you for this time for us to be together. Continue to accept our praise and our honor and our love for you and all that you have showered upon us as well. In Jesus' name, amen. I uh, picked this topic to, to uh, work with from the teachings of Jesus because I think it's a very important one. And my reasoning behind that has a lot to do with uh, what Jesus has had, had to say about it. And uh, we'll take a look at that in just a moment. But I want you to think in an, about things in another way for a moment. I want you to remember back if some of you, before you ever dated or met somebody uh, that you uh, fell for, that you think about all the things that went through your mind in terms of, uh, is this real or is it not real? Uh, you know, is this person gonna be the right one or, or are they not going to be the right one? But I want you to think of a question that a lot of people ask themselves too, especially when they get to the point that they're now brides or grooms. How do I know when I'm really in love? Is this true love? Is this going to work out? Or is this going to last? How do I know? Can I be certain? And how many brides or grooms have actually backed out of a wedding after answering that in, a, in the negative? I think it's important for us to ask that as Christians. Do I love Christ as much as I think I do? How much love can I show? How do I show it? And how much do I love him? Because in the New Testament, Paul compares the, the church to the bride of Christ. How much does a church love the Lord? How much not only church worldwide, but in this congregation and each individual? Another question that you might look at when you're thinking about love and love in Christ is, is there anything that's going to keep me from loving him? Is there something that I love so much more than I love him that I just can't give it up? You know, a, a bride or a groom should be asking the same thing. Is there something that I'm going to have in my life that I can't give up that's going to possibly cause a a rift in our marriage and keep us from being the family we need to be. So when I was looking at this lesson, I thought about a lot of those things. And I thought about the love that, that Christ had for us. I thought about the love that God has for us. But I ended up coming back and looking at the love that Jesus teaches us about and is an example of in our lives and for us. I want you to, if you will, for a moment, I want to look at uh, something that I found online that has more to do, uh, at least under topic, has more to do with weddings and so forth. I don't want you to think about those as we think about uh, uh, the idea of love. Now, this uh, four psych, um, I don't know, if, psychologists who uh, discussed this idea of uh, the difference between being in love and and loving someone. And they take that as being two different things. So the stronger of that being loving someone, being in love 
being at that questioning stage whether I think this is going to last, whether I think this is the right thing, and so forth. But I want you to uh, consider a couple points that they, that they make, and I'm going to read them so I don't miss these. They said, at some point in time, most of us will know the feeling. Your heart flutters when you see your partner walk in the room. And it feels like the time you spend together, you're just on top of the world. Being in love is part of life that many people strive to experience. And it can seem like every character in the movies and books, magazines and stories that we enjoy reading focused around it in one way or another. Of course, there are many types of love, and we're going again these psychologists. Some people feel butterflies when they're infatuated. Happy couples married for years have a deep, profound attached attachment to each other. And a parent's love for children is often regarded as one of the strongest loves that one can experience. Now, I want you to keep that particular sentence in mind when we're looking at God's love for us. But when it comes to romance, the feelings of love and being in love are separate and depend on the stage of your relationship. You may have used those phrases, in love or loving someone. Now the idea that they're talking about is the difference between saying some whirlwind emotions that you have that, that uh, you feel and they're not lasting. I kind of think of uh, the seed that's grown on the, the rock or the pathway and it grows up. It's either choked by the cares of the world or Satan comes and takes it away and it has no depth. And uh, sometimes that's the kind of love that people have for Christ and for the church and it's taken away. It's never had the opportunity to mature and to grow. And I think that's an important part. And here's a sentence that I'd like to share with you I thought was pretty good. Growing to love the real person and accepting who they are with both strengths and weaknesses can make a wonderful difference in a relationship. Get that? Growing to love a real person and accepting who they are with both strengths and weaknesses can make for a wonderful difference in a relationship. Now, there's more to that, but I want you to think about that and apply it to our relationship with God. Getting to know God and recognizing Him for who He is and for whether you like everything He tells you or not, but growing to love Him and building that relationship means maybe at some point when things get difficult or hard, you're going to pass the test and you're going to make it through, you and the Lord together. That's when you know you're really in love, is when you can get through things together, despite what happens and what occurs in your life. I want to take you back to the Old Testament, to the book of Ezekiel for a moment. Chapter 16. And that chapter has always intrigued me, and uh, among uh, some others, but this one in particular. Ezekiel, speaking for God, says uh, that he came and he saw Jerusalem, verse 2. And I saw all the things that she had done. And I said, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As for your nativity on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. Sounds like a baby that wasn't loved or accepted at birth, doesn't it? He said, verse five, no one's eye pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you, but you were thrown out into the open field when you yourselves were loathed on the day you were born. And when I, talking about God, passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you in your blood, live, live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. I made you thrive like a plant 
in the field and you grew and matured and became very beautiful. Your breasts were formed, your hair grew, but you were naked and bare. And when I passed by you again, I looked upon you. Indeed, your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. And yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you. And you became mine, says the Lord. Then I washed you in water. And yes, I thoroughly washed off your blood. And I anointed you with oil. I clothed you in embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin. And I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I abandoned you, or adorned you, excuse me, with ornaments, bracelets on your wrist and a chain on your neck. And I put a jewel in your nose and earrings in your ears and beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver and your clothing was a fine linen and so on. You see how the Lord responded to Israel, to Judah, to Jerusalem. How much he loved these people. Remember we said the love of, of a child that you have sometimes is the strongest love possible. God loved them as he loves a child. He does the same for us today. He loves us in every way. Because he created us and he made us. And when we think about that, it's really interesting. Because when we go to, to another portion of this chapter, look at uh, verse 15 and following. But you trusted in your own beauty. You played the harlot because of your fame. And you poured out your harlotry on everyone passing by who would have it. You took some of your garments, and he could have said that I gave you, and adorned multicolored high places for yourself. And you played the harlot on them. Such things should not happen nor be. You have taken your beautiful jewelry from my gold and my silver, which I had given you, and made for yourself male images and played the harlot with them. You took your embroidered garments and covered them, and you set my oil and my incense before them. You took your embroidered garments, excuse me, verse 19, also my food which I gave you, the pastry of fine flour, oil and honey which I feel, fed you. You set it before them as sweet incense and so it was, said the Lord. Can you understand why God would be disappointed, upset, broken hearted over people that he took that much care of and they turn around and take the things that he provided for them and give them to someone else, honoring that person as the one who was the giver of those things to them. And several times in the Old Testament to the prophets, that's exactly how God describes these people. And how would he describe us today? Not just the people in this room, but in this country, in this world. How do we do the same things that these people did? Are there things in our lives that we allow to get ahead of us and we take those and we give them all the credit in the world for what God has done for us. Once you think about that, when you think about how God pines for our love, for us to show Him the kind of care that He showed us, that He looks forward to seeing us in that same way and our seeing Him. So when we look at Jesus in the New Testament and we read about what he says about love, I think Jesus read all these passages. I think he read in the Old Testament the law that God set up back in Deuteronomy and the other passages that we look at under Moses wrote. And I think he looks at these passages like this, he's looked at them, and he realizes where the world is standing. And so when he's talking about I give unto you a new commandment. And John says over in 1 John, it's not a new commandment. It's an old commandment. But then he goes through and describes what is new about it. What it is that Jesus is try has been trying to say all along about what love really is. And so I want to take you through for a little bit some passages in the New Testament in particular. I to... Uh, that apply to, to Jesus, or Jesus applied to us. 
and where I believe he's trying to teach us the real true meaning of love. Let's start in John chapter 13, verse 34. John 13, 34. Again, I'm going to repeat a couple of these, so uh, please understand. A new commandment I give you. This is Jesus talking. I give you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another. And what I see about that that's new, at least maybe in the eyes of the people in the Old Testament, the Jews are now there in front of Jesus, is he said, as I have loved you. In the Old Testament, we were told to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, all of our mind, and, and so forth. And so uh, we, they've got that down. They've memorized that. But here he says, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. Now, if we go and look at Jesus' life from beginning to end, we see what he's done for his apostles, for the disciples, for those people who were uh, needing healing, those people who needed food at times, uh, and others. Uh, healing from leprosy or whatever it might be. And we see that Jesus loved these people, even though he didn't know them personally up to that point, he still loved them and he did things for them. He had compassion, it's often said, said, and we'll look at some verses like that if we have time. 1 John 2, 7. John tries to explain these things as I mentioned a while ago. He says, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you've heard from the beginning. Yeah, we've taught about love. Yeah, we, God's mentioned that you need to love one another. He's mentioned that love is important and God has shown you love. But John says it's an old commandment. It's just a, we want you to look at it more completely, more fully, and really understand it what it means to love. Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Again, in Mark 12, 30, and also in Luke 10, 27, Mark 12, 28 through 31. Uh, and I look at that one a little more closely. Mark 12, 28 through 31, Jesus answered him, talking about the one who asked him what was the greatest commandments. He said, the first of all the commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. This is the first commandment. And then the second is like, like, is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other greater than these. And that's the emphasis that I want to put that the writer has here at the end of this verse. There's no greater commandment than these. Even Paul and Peter and other writers have told us that if we don't have love for God, we don't have love for one another, we can't be his disciple. We have to love one another. That means that no matter what someone else has done to me, how I feel about the way they conduct their lives, I still need to love them. Well, how deep is that love? How far down inside my, my heart should that love go? Just what does Jesus mean by all that, that you've got to love them? Let's go on and look at some other passages that the Lord shares with us. Mark 12, 34. When, it, when the, the Jew asked Jesus about the greatest, and Jesus asked him at one point to say, well, he says, well, you're right. That's it. You've got it. Jesus turned to him and said, Jesus saw the man answered wisely. And he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. What did he mean, you're not far? Does that mean he, he was already believing? He'd already confessed, he'd been baptized, he's living in, uh, as a Christian. Uh, how, what are we talking about? I think in essence what we're talking about is that the kingdom, the church, is built on this kind of love that Jesus has been talking about and we're looking at. If you really love people and you really love God and you really love the Lord, then you're not far. Because the kingdom hadn't yet been established 
when Jesus was speaking. So he said, you're, you're almost there. And so I think it's important to, look, to take a look at it that way. Let's go to Luke, uh, excuse me, let's go to John 14, verses 23 through 24. Jesus answered in another situation and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Now think about all the things that Jesus has taught. All the things that Jesus has, has uh, put out before the people. If you don't hear my words and you don't keep my commandments. Now this is two different things, isn't it? Hearing is one thing. Obeying is something else. He said you've got to hear it, but you've also got to obey it. You've got to hear it and you've got to follow it. You got to believe in me, but you got to follow me. I've got more to say on things than just hearing and doing. I want you to follow through. I've got more for you to do. Now he says, I "Told that guy you're not far from the kingdom." And then he he goes through and says, "If anyone loves me, he will keep my word." You ever stop and think about the word "keep"? When he's using "keep my word." What do we do when we ignore the, the word? We try to push it out of our heads, don't we? We try to push it out of our lives. We try to push it away so our conscience doesn't have those prongs digging in and, and making us stop for what it is we want to do. You ever go into the kitchen and there's some piece of food in the refrigerator that you knew you shouldn't be eating, but you just wanted it so badly and it gnawed at you all day long until finally you pushed aside all those knowledge and understanding that you had about it, better stay away from it, and you went in and grabbed it and ate it. Things like that happen to us all day long, or at least they're tempted to do so. And he says, you keep my word. In other words, you're able to push those things aside. <clears throat> Am I going to make mistakes? Yes. Am I going to falter? Yes. What's going to help me? God's Christ, you're going to pick me up. I'm going to come back to the word and I'm going to follow the word. And he says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. What would parents say to kids? If you love me, you'll do what I ask you. Have any of your parents ever said that to you? Any of you ever said that to your kids? If you really love me, you do what I ask you to do. Maybe your wife or husband said it to you. I don't know. But I know... I remember one time in particular, my mom said something like that to me. And she went off in the other room crying because I didn't get up right away and go do it. Do you know, it's, it's, it's the way God feels when we don't do what he asks. It's the way Jesus feels when we don't do what we ask. It's a broken heart. And I can't imagine how many times I've broken his heart. But if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Remember uh, on the uh, mount when Jesus gave the sermon, uh, the verses five, or chapters 5 through 7 of Matthew that we read them? Look at some of the things he talks about in terms of what I consider to be love that we're looking at. Blessed are the merciful. And we're going to look at a passage later where mercy is introduced. For they shall obtain what? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. If I want mercy, I should be one who provides mercy with others. Then he says, verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called what? Sons of God. Remember in the Old Testament, whose image are we made in? God's image. How are we, how do we become Christian? We're adopted. Peacemakers is what God is looking for in his children. Peacemakers is what we need to be. And then you go to Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. You're the salt of the earth. And then he says, and you're also the, the light. I thought of a couple of things that, that I compared to these. Jesus is telling us we're the salt of the earth. We're the light on a, you know, on a hill. We're the billboard. We're, we're the billboard for Jesus. People look at us 
and decide whether or not they want something to do with the church, with following Christ. We're the sampler at Walmart and Sam's Club. Here, you want to try this? Try this. That's what we mean by being the salt of the earth. We provide flavor to the world, hoping that the world will see Jesus and want to take part in it. We're the light that draws people to the church. So that people then decide whether they want anything to do with Jesus Christ and the church. We're that sample. Have we gone bad? Have we been sitting out too long? Stay up stagnant? Now those are some of the things we have to think about. Am I stagnant? Am I rotten? Am I, am I stale? I need to be that billboard and that sampler that Jesus asked me to be. I want you to look at a couple of passages like this. Uh, John 15, verses 9 through 14. The first word here, as. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Live or abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and I abide in His love. Remember the times that God spoke up about how proud, how happy He was, how pleased He was with Jesus because Jesus accomplished the things that He did at that point? Jesus is saying, if you abide and do my commandments, you will abide in my love because doing my commandments is abiding in my love. It's showing your love for me. It's showing your love for others. Greater love, he says at the end of this, has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And you, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you, he said. Isn't that the greatest example of somebody, excuse me, doing what he said? following through and living the way he said. You're my friend because I laid down my life for you. We need to practice doing good to please God because God is good. Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4. At the end of that, I'm going to look at verse 3. Talking about how you practice giving. He said, when you do a charitable deed, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. I've always had trouble with that. My hands get together too much. I either hold them like this or like this. They both know what the other one's doing most of the time. But I don't think that's what he's talking about. What he's saying is, you're not out there to make a public show of what a good person you are. You're doing it because you love God. You're doing it because you love people. You're doing it because you love your children. You're doing it because you have that love that God's been talking about. There's no greater love than that which causes you to do the things that Jesus asks us to do without having to, to make yourself do it. You do it because that's the kind of person Jesus had made you into being. And he wants you to be. He said, your father... The end of verse four, your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Now go down to, go to John 16, verse 27. For the father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from, the, from God. The father loves you because you love me. And how, Jesus, do you know that I love you? Because you believe that I came forth from God. You keep my commandments. All the things that he's mentioned and said so far. But I really like the next passage. And I talked about a marriage. This is where I really get into the idea of it being like a marriage. I want to see if you can find the same things in this passage that I found. I'm going to start down in, in verse 3, uh, Matthew 6. I'm sorry, wrong place. Uh, I want to start in verse 10. He says, All of mine are yours, and yours are mine, 
and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. Matthew 7, or John 17. These are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep them through your name, those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, and also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. I'm in them and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, perfect, complete, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you love, have loved me. Notice anything about similarity to a marriage? It's a maturity, a growing thing where we grow closer and closer together. In the beginning, we may not seem so much at one, especially when you get uh, to Christmas time the first year and she wants a, this kind of a tree and you want that kind of a tree. She wants these kind of ornaments and you want those kind of ornaments. You've always put this kind of stuff in your all's tree and she's always put that kind of stuff on her tree. And what do you do? Well, those things in themselves aren't important, but it's what you do that's important. It's you agree to share certain things together and do things a way that's yours, that makes you one and that you grow closer together. There's a lot of things through life, through our marriages that are like that, where we learn to, to push aside differences. We realize that by standing up for certain things, that thing really isn't as important as my marriage is. That way of doing things is not more important than the, than the fact that I love and care about my spouse. Those are, that's more important than anything else. Jesus says all through here, through these things, he's trying to show us what's really important and what we need to, to push aside and what we need to hold on to. And here at the uh, Mark 7, chapter 7, verses 18, 23, uh, you've heard this a lot. It's not what goes into a man, into his stomach that matters. It's what comes out of his heart through his mouth. I want you to picture a person's mouth and, and their heart. I want you to picture things going down to the stomach. They don't come back through the mouth unless you're, you're sick, something's wrong with you. But normally what comes out of the mouth is what's in the heart, what we call sometimes the Bible heart. It's what comes out of there that's important. And so... He says, uh, you be careful about what you do. And in, in a marriage, and that's sometimes what we learn, one of the first things we learn. It's how we say things and what we say to one another. Sometimes it's, it's important. Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said, for where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And then in Matthew 12, verse 35, he said, a good man, a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. And I want you to look at one of the examples that Jesus gave of what, just how deep love really is, needs to get. Just how deep does that love become? Do you remember the story of the widow with the two mites? There were people that gave, gave the church or gave the, the temple huge amounts of money, but they probably had hundreds of times more than that still sitting at home. So it wasn't like they missed it or anything. So it was easy to give it up. It didn't take much from their heart to say, you know, I can part with this. But the poor widow, what does it say about her? Mark 12, verses 41 through 44. She out of the poverty, the poverty of her heart, she put in all that she had Notice the last three words here. Her whole livelihood. Everything. Do you remember in the Old Testament? The woman that when Elijah came up to her said, uh, Go, would you fix me a, a, a small cake and get something to drink? And she said uh, she would. It was, but she said she had been planning to fix that for she and her son because it was the last they had and they were preparing to eat it and die. She went ahead and fixed it for him and he showed her that God cared. And you remember in the New Testament says this is the only widow during that time of famine that God helped out directly. 
the only one that he that Elisha went to. And she then was shown how to fix the pots, put the water in, and the oil comes out, and she sells the oil to help get her through that period of time. This widow gave those two mites. She gave everything. How deep is your love? What are you willing to give up? How far are you willing to go? How deep are you willing to reach into your heart to share with the Savior? And that's what he's talking about. That's what Jesus is going to Remember the story that Rick shared with us recently, the two debtors? One was uh, quite a bit of money that he owed, and the other one, a small amount. And uh, the uh, person that they owed him to forgave both of them. And Jesus said, which one do you think loved the uh, one who, who forgave them the most? And the guy said, I suppose the one whom he gave forgave the most. And Jesus said, you are right. You have judged rightly the one who uh, gave up the most. And you remember the, the uh, story of the good neighbor. That's what I call it sometimes. Other people call it the good Samaritan. The man, he loved his enemy. Someone that was supposed to be his enemy. Took and, and doctored him, took him to the inn and helped him. Jesus talks about Matthew 10, the cup of cold water that you give to someone. And then he also talks about going the extra mile. All these things are, Jesus is showing us how far we need to go to love others. To show how far to deep in our hearts we need to reach to be able to love others and to show love. And there's many more here, including the passage where Jesus says we need to love one another. Go back to Ezekiel 16, if you will, sometime. Look out over closely. Get an idea of just how much it hurts Jesus, how much it hurts God when they don't think we love them. They aren't willing to show our love to them. That we'd rather do other things instead. It's hard. It's hard to read those things and not be convicted of things that you know you should be doing or shouldn't be doing. It is for me. Father in heaven, we're so sorry for any pain or agony that we cause you because of the things that we do or don't do. We know you love us greatly, that you provided the possibility of things for us, of great, great things. And Father, help us to recognize and give you credit and thanks and praise for all the things that you've made possible. We know you've healed people we know you provided for their needs. We know that you continue to set a beautiful world before us. And there's so many things here that we have yet to even to take advantage of. And we thank you for all of it. I ask you to be with us through this week that we can show the love that you've shown us back to you and to others as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.